Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. Awesome. How many of you are those social media survey filler out people that when those surveys come online, everybody's like, no, I'm not either. I hate them. But we're going to do one this morning anyway, just for the fun of it. And it's going to be fun. So what, I'm going to read some questions off. And as if, if it applies to you, if you could put up your hand, that would be awesome. Even if you're not typically a raise your hand kind of person, half mast is fine. You can just kind of like, okay, yeah, all right. Okay, so here's the first one. How many of you will cross the street on a red light if you know you can make it and there's no traffic coming? Oh, yes, good amount of you. Okay, not quite as many as the other service, though. How many of you bring your own snacks into the movie theater? Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of you in this one. This is funny. I think probably most out of all the services. How many of you will talk in the movie theater while the theater, the movie's going? Okay, a few of you. Some of you are like, oh, yeah. Okay, now here's, this one's really important. This one's very important. How many of you will double dip your chip in the dip in public parties? Holy cow! I think we're gonna stop having dip at church events. No more dip. Okay, this one is very important too, especially for those of you that are the ones that clean around the house. How many of you, when you drop a peanut or grape or other small piece of food, just kind of kick it under the fridge or the stove instead of picking it up? Oh, I made a lot. There's a lot of you in this service too. How many, okay, here's one. This one's a little bit more, this one can be a little bit more personal. How many of you will reuse new member discount codes by opening up or using new email addresses? <laughs> oh, there's a few more. I think there's a the most in this service. This is fun service. This is crazy. Some of you are like, I didn't even know you could do that. I'm gonna do that. How many of you frequently download and use the cheat sheets to video games? A whole lot of you in this one too. And how many of you will ask for a bite of someone's food and take a bite anyway, even if they say no? Okay, that's about average in the services, all right. I, just, I think this service is definitely the little bit more fall into the rebel category. And, uh, and you might be wondering, what the heck does this have to do with anything? I will tell you in just a bit, but if you are if you're with us for the first time, if you're watching Facebook Live for the first time, or if the f with us for the first time this year, we have been on a series. It's called How's Your Soul? And we've been discovering what it means to have a healthy soul. And how does our soul get and stay healthy? What does it need? What does our soul need to be healthy? And, you know, I think most of us would, would admit that we are aware of what our physical body needs to be healthy. Now, whether we apply it is a whole nother story, but for the most part, we are aware of what our body needs to be physically healthy, true? But I think a lot of us don't really know what our soul needs to be healthy. Or maybe like our physical body, we know, but we don't apply it. And so we want a healthy soul because real living starts with the inside you. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about our soul. We're talking about the inside us that inside us. And one of the verses that's been a real theme over the last couple of weeks, it's 3 John 2, and the writer, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. And what he was saying that how it goes on the inside is how it's gonna go on the outside. In other words, there is a big connection between the inside us and how and what we experience in life in the outside part of our life, in the outside world, what that looks like. And so we, everything can look great on the outside, but if there is ill health on the inside in our soul, it's only a matter of time until that ill health comes out and begins to affect 
our outside life. And so we want to make sure we are giving our soul a healthy checkup, a regular checkup. And if you, well, how do you give your soul a checkup? Well, you can go online and you can watch week one. And as you're talking about how to give your soul a checkup. But we want to make sure we are giving our soul what it needs to be healthy. And one of the things our soul needs is it needs fuel. Just like our body needs fuel, your soul needs fuel. And the prime fuel source for energizing your soul is the presence of God. He is the prime. His presence is the main way because that's where our soul is home. God's, it was God's breath. It says back in the creation story in Genesis that God breathed into man and he became a living soul. And so our soul has its starting place with God, which means our soul is home first with God in God's presence. That's where our soul is going to be primarily, find its most energizing or its most refreshing, its greatest sense of refueling is first and foremost in God's presence. Now we also learned last week that our soul also needs work and rest. And sometimes the things though that, we think the, the responsibilities that we think are causing disturbance in our soul, those responsibilities that we kind of want to offload and get rid of, the answer isn't offloading those things and getting rid of those weights or those responsibilities. The answer is found in my husband's amazing illustration. If you, were, if you didn't see it, you got to go online and watch the message. It was so good. Got to see his hunky muscles all pumping some iron. And, but... We, what happens is what enables you to bear weight and lift weight? Well, a barbell makes all of the difference in trying to lug around free weights on your own. And that barbell is like a yoke. It helps us to carry weight and responsibility so we get strong. Because that is a goal. We want a healthy soul. It makes us strong. Well, today, we're going to look at two letters that your soul desperately needs. N-O. Look at the person beside you and say, just say no. Just say no. Just say no is really important for your soul. Because as noted in the opening survey, we humans tend to resist restrictions, don't we? We tend to resist that restrictions of any sort, whether they, they're in the form of commands or rules or just simply boundaries. We don't like those restrictions. We think they're cramping our style. And we, even though we might mentally know, agree that restrictions are good, there is something in us that's just like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't know if you chronically late people. Yes, you know there is a restriction. There's a time to start, but it's all just show up just because I don't want to. But what about what about you five to ten kilometers over the speed limit, people? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, we resist restrictions. We don't like those. What about in school where the teacher's like, no talking? So what do you do? You whisper really loud. <laughs> is it true? Or what about staying up late? When you know you need to rest, your body needs rest. Or we can't resist our phone when we really know we should be paying attention to the human in front of us. <laughs> Isn't that true? We don't like restrictions. And the list is endless. And too often, we think of restrictions in a negative context, that restrictions are just restricting my freedom. However, this is a really important truth. True freedom needs restrictions. True freedom needs restrictions. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I'll tell you, it does. Because what is true freedom? See, much of what we imagine freedom to be, I can just do whatever. I'll just have fun. I'll just no restraints and no restrictions I can do. That's actually not real freedom. It's usually chaos. I'll give you an illustration. How many of you like jazz? Any jazz? You can appreciate good jazz. Let me qualify that. There's a difference between good jazz and bad jazz that you would have like, please shut it off. No more. Here's the thing. For musicians, there's a lot about jazz. It's improvisation. But in order for good jazz musicians to produce good jazz, there are restrictions that they need to abide by before they have the freedom to improvise. 
For example, they need to have practiced. Yes, that is the difference between good jazz and bad jazz. They have the restriction. They have to practice. There's also the restriction of making sure their instrument is tuned and tuned to work with the other instruments and not tuned in some other key that doesn't work with what the others are playing. There's also a really important restriction that the drummer, a jazz drummer, is required to hear because there's a very distinct rhythm for jazz that is different for, than for pop, for rock, or thrash, or any other kind of genre. It's a very unique rhythm. And so the drummer is restricted. He just can't play whatever rhythm he wants. He could, but then it wouldn't be jazz. There's a certain rhythm that goes along with jazz. And so for all of these things, these are all restrictions, but they are what enable the musicians then to have the freedom to improvise. So restrictions enable freedom. Freedom you, involves restrictions. Here's students. Or if you can remember back to that period of time in your life. How many of you remember those teachers that would give the assignments that were really vague and open-ended? And you're just like, what do you mean? Like, what? Like, what? This, for example, English. I want you to write a story. And you're like, well, what? Like, what kind of story? Instantly, your brain goes looking for a restriction. It's like when it's open-ended, write a story. It's just like, okay, brain freezes. It's like, uh, I don't even know where to start. But instantly your brain starts, well, how long? What kind of story? Is it a true story? Is it supposed to be a fiction story? What kind of topic is it? Is there a specific theme I need to say? How long? How many pages? How many, how many words? Our brain goes looking for that restriction. And once the restriction is in place, then it gives us a freedom to be able to write. Or even if somebody just comes up to you and says, tell me your story. And it's, uh, where do I start? How much information do you want? Where do I begin? But if someone says, tell me your story in six words. Yeah, six words right there. Tell me your story in six words. Then you start to think, okay, I gotta keep it short and sweet and what's the important stuff. And so restrictions are what enable freedom. And as much as we hate to admit it, we crave restrictions. Your soul craves restriction. All of you free-spirited people that are chafing right now as we're talking about restrictions, your soul needs restrictions. It will enable your free spirit to flourish. Why does our soul crave restriction? Well, we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden. And we continue to go back to that story because that story defines our story. And it, it, it shows where the God's overarching upper story began because there's a bigger story that all of our stories are part of. And in Genesis, when God was creating, it said he created everything good. Everything was created good. There was nothing bad. There was nothing terrible. There was nothing, nothing had been corrupted. There wasn't any sin to ruin or damage anything. There were dangers. Everything was good. And yet God set up one restriction. Well, if it was good, what's the need for the one restriction? Look at this. Genesis 2, 16 to 17. God's speaking to humanity and he says, eat freely from any and all trees. Everyone say any and all. Any and all. Eat freely from any and all trees in the garden. I only require that you abstain from the fruit of one tree. Eat from any and all. Abstain from one. See, God was making it really easy for humanity. In other words, one, don't touch Everything else, go for it. Now, if you tend to be one of those people who often view God, or maybe you've had the view of God that he's a restrictive God. Why would I want to follow him? I just, it's just, he's just a whole bunch of rules, a whole bunch of don'ts, a whole bunch of can'ts, and a whole bunch of shouldn'ts. God is this restrictive thing. I don't want to have somebody telling me or what I can and cannot do. If you think God is, if you view God as a restrictive God, I think it's important that you really, we, we really take note of this creation story and notice that God gave permission before he gave restriction. In other words, any and all the trees, you can eat all of it. This one right here? Nope. 
Why would God create something beautiful and wonderful and say, don't touch? Well, two reasons. The first reason is that God wanted us to love him. And in order for there to be love, there has to be the element of choice. God didn't want to control humanity. And so he set up the power of choice. He gave humanity a free will. But the second message that he was also sending by putting up this restriction, he was sending the message to humanity, listen, restriction is good. Restriction is good. Your soul needs restriction. God wanted them to understand that there are limitations that are healthy for your soul. You absolutely need these restrictions. And here's what's interesting. God first put restrictions on himself. Maybe you've wondered or have gotten into conversation with somebody who's like, well, if God is so good, and if God is so powerful, then why is the planet in such a mess? Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he fix it? Why isn't he doing this? And why did he allow this? And why is this? And why is this? And why is this? Here's the thing. Here's the first way God restricted himself. He made all of creation. It's all his. But then he gave earth, everything in it, everything that functions in it, he gave it to humanity as a stewardship and a trust. He said, all of this is mine, but guess what? I'm giving it to you to take care of it, nurture it, and make it grow. It's yours. This is your room. The whole earth, humanity, this is your room. Keep it clean. I ain't coming in there to remove the stuff that starts growing. So make sure stuff doesn't start growing. And see, God restricted himself that way. The other way God restricted himself was by giving humanity free will. God wasn't going to control his creation. And so the fact that God gave us the power to choose. He gave us a free will. That is the way God restricted him. So, if God put restrictions on himself before he put restrictions on man, and if we're made in God's image, then that must mean that restriction actually is good and necessary for our soul. Freedom isn't true freedom unless there are restrictions. And see, our world today doesn't get this. Everything our world holds up or would try to declare is, this is what freedom is. No rules, no restrictions, no restraints. Do whatever you want. Do what feels good. If you feel it in your heart, just let your heart lead you. If you feel it in your soul, just do whatever you want. You know what's the problem with that is? Is if you take that train and ride it, It takes you into a place that you don't want to be because a world with everybody doing what everybody feels like is right for me. It's like, I just decide that what feels good for me today is I haul off and I punch Pete because I didn't like the way he looked at me. And boy, that felt like relief for my soul. Thank you, Jesus. I can just do what there is no restraints. Whoa. Now, his face is probably saying something different. See, that absolutely, do whatever your heart tells you to do is the stupidest reasoning anybody could ever, number one, think of, number two, believe, and number three, follow. It makes zero sense. We need restrictions. Our soul needs a no. And it's not just bad things we need to say no to. It's good for you to hear yourself say no. Yes, I could eat the whole bag of chips, but no. Yes, I could buy that 30th pair of shoes, but no. And that's not just girls. Oh, no, I have heard stories about the boys' shoes. I could stay up all day. I could just play video games all day. But no. Oh, I could buy that new piece of tech. But no. None of those 
things are bad. Some of the chips are kind of questionable, the whole bag. <laughs> but here's the question. What are you saying no to? What are you saying no to? What? So I'm going to look at what will the good no do for your soul? See, there's a good no and there's a bad no. And see, unfortunately, some of the things when we say no to certain things, we're saying no to the things that are actually good for us. Because a lot of the times, this connects to my husband's message last week, we're saying no to responsibility. We're saying no to, to stretching. We're saying no to things that are a little bit tough and might pull us out of our comfort zone. We're saying no to things that are actually good weight and responsibility that if we just learn how to bear them rightly, they will create strength in us. They'll strengthen our soul. So there's a difference between a good no for your soul and a bad no for your soul. And I can't tell you what that is. There's a few things that are without question, this is a good no. This is a bad no. Saying no to Jesus is a bad no. That'll just, just, just making that one clear. But what will the good no do for your soul? Number one, it will keep your soul on track when storms come. And a storm in life is anything unexpected. It's when just life gets really confusing. It's like in a storm, visibility becomes very unclear. Sometimes it gets dark. And storms are when those things hit, they come at you in life. And it could be an entire season. It could be a circumstance where it's just like, I don't know what to do. I am confused. I don't know what direction to go. I can hardly see straight. It's like, I don't know where to go. And it's in those storms when restrictions are absolutely vital. But it's important they're in place before the storm hits. For example, how many of you have ever driven on Highway 2 in the middle of a really bad snowstorm? It's horrible because there's so many trucks that go down that highway flying up all this snow and you can be trucking along doing your own little thing. And what happens is you get vertigo and so you can't see anything. And it's crazy. But when you are in a snowstorm, it's hard, to, when it's hard to see. It's difficult to know what direction to go. How many of you know there's a certain restriction called lane lines that are really beneficial to keeping you on track, not going off into the ditch? And those restrictions are absolutely vital for enabling you to continue on your journey in the middle of a storm. When they're not in place, man, that's when it's really hard to drive. When there's not those clear definitions, when there aren't the restrictions, it's just like, it makes driving exhausting, doesn't it? It's like, it's kind of scary. It's just like, oh, am I in the right place or not? But those lane lines are vital. So what might some highway lane lines look like, practically speaking, for life? I'm going to throw some out there to you. Here's a lane line. If you're married, the lane line of not hanging out alone with the opposite sex without your spouse. That's a great lane line to have in place. Remember, we want lane lines in place before the storm comes. Because if you wait till afterwards, you could already be in the ditch. Because, oh, cute honey comes along right after you and other honey had a bad spat. And it's just like, they just understand you. And you can pour your heart out to them. And they just get you. Ditch. Everyone say, ditch. Worst case scenario, head on collision. Here's another one. Speech. What lane lines do you have in regards to what kind of language you use? I'm not talking about four-letter words. I'm talking about what kind of speech. Negativity, complaining. If that's a regular habit, if you don't have a restriction, if you don't have a lane line about that, man, negativity when storms hit, you can get sucked into that vortex really quickly. Here's another one, social drinkers. Do you have a lane line of how much, how often, when, and where you drink? Because when a storm hits, you know what? I've been there, done that. It is really easy. If you don't have that lane line, it's really easy to just whatever. It's really easy when a storm hits to want to check out, to just want to numb, to want to forget. It's just, I just need help relaxing. Singles and friendships with the opposite sex. Here's one. Do you have a lane line about how much of your soul you casually share with friends of the opposite sex? 
I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about how much of your soul do you casually share with friends of the opposite sex? Because sometimes when you start sharing too much of your soul, there's a bond that forms because that's the way we're made. And you could have a bond starting too, too close, too soon, or you could end up taking something that was a great friendship and it can go into ugh, ugly zone. It's like fatal attraction. Ugh, it's gross. What lane line? See, wherever you have a tendency to lose control, you need a lane line. A good no so that you won't hit the ditch when the storms hit. Number two, a good, the good no will keep your soul from a BUI. Do you know what a BUI is? A BUI is being under the influence. How many of you have ever found yourself in a setting or situation where you know you should not be in that setting? You know you should be not be in that situation, but you just find it hard to not say no. It's just like, uh, and I'm not talking about addictions. I'm talking maybe about relationships or friendships or settings or activities where it's just like, I know I shouldn't be here, but I just can't say no. I remember there was a season in my life, this is before I was really following Jesus, and I was, and the friend group I was hanging out with was considerably older, making a lot more money than I was, and they were really skilled at blowing all of that money and partying all weekend long. And so when this is your friend group, this is what you do. And, our, and this went on for quite a few months, and I remember the whole time I was thinking, this is dumb. Like, every time I get sober, I'm just like, what was I thinking? This is the stupidest thing I could be doing with my life right now. I am losing a lot of money, number one, but then what else is creating? This is just stupid. But I was under the influence of something called insecurity and fear and the need to fit in and the need for approval. And there was a ski trip that was planned and it was a long bus ride, it was a weekend out, weekend in which a ski trip, this group didn't really ski, which meant it was just gonna be a whole binge fest all weekend long. I remember the night when I picked up, I decided, okay, I'm not, this is done. I am done with this, this can't go on. And I picked up the phone, I made a phone call, and I said like one sentence, like, I'm not coming on the ski trip. And I hung up. <laughs> and it was like, that was the most liberating no I'd ever made in my life up until that point. And see, Paul describes us being under the influence in this way. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 in the message, it says, just because something is technically legal doesn't mean it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. See, there's some of you who think you're living in freedom because you think you're just kind of, oh, I'm just doing this, I'll just do it this way, I'll just do what I feel like, and, just, and you're actually not free. You're controlled by your whims, and they're not leading you into a place of help. See, freedom in Jesus is not just to say yes, it's also to say no. Because not everything is good, not everything is beneficial, not everything is healthy for our soul. And see, when we are able to say no, being able to say no to those things that could be destructive allows us to live in freedom from things like regret. Being able to say no allows us to live in freedom from things like guilt and shame and, and consequences. See, I can be completely forgiven and accepted by God and yet carry consequences the entirety of my life because of certain choices I made that will carry consequences. And see, this is where baptism is so powerful because baptism gives you the power to be able to say no continually to those things that would harm you, those, those things that had controlled you maybe or still control you. If you're under controlling influences in your life, you know what? Baptism is the greatest thing you could do because when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you make that decision, it's you, you cut off those controlling influences and you begin to experience real freedom. And the third thing the good no will do, it will remind your soul that there is more to really living than just what this world offers. And see, Paul described it this way. He said, Colossians 3, 1 to 3, since you became alive again, so to speak, when Christ rose from the dead, 
Now set your sights on the rich treasures and joys of heaven where he sits beside God in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Don't spend your time worrying about things down here. You should have as little desire for this world as a dead person does. Your real life is in heaven with Christ and God. And see, when I recognize, see, when the motive behind my no, see, when the, the why behind my no is that I recognize that my soul wasn't made just for this world alone. My soul was made for a place, it, my soul was made for heaven. And see, heaven is in, in, in heaven the, in the in scripture. It's it's not just this place, this ethereal place that our soul goes and floats away to when we die. When it talks about heaven in scripture, it refers more to the context of our relationship with God. And heaven will be when where God is the realm where God is. And that's where everything, where God, there is nothing hindering God. There is nothing that's out of control. There's nothing out of order. Everything is functioning properly. And there will come a time when heaven and earth overlap and become one again. And see, that's when, that's what our soul was made for. It was made for that eternal place with God. Where we spend an eternity on our soul, there will be nothing between us and God. There will be nothing hindering our relationships. We will be able to function as fully human beings, the way we were originally made to function. No brokenness, no dysfunction in our soul. And see, our soul needs to keep focused on heaven because this world isn't our ultimate home. God is. And the good no reorients us to eternity. And see, this is so important because your soul will live forever. But the where that forever takes place is determined by what you do with Jesus. If Jesus is absent from your life, your forever won't be very won't be what it was originally made to be. If you're, Jesus is kind of on the back burner, he's just kind of like, ah, he's kind of a thought in your mind. <clears throat> now it's, see, following Jesus is what takes us into that forever, that eternity that we experience now. It's a life that goes beyond when we leave, when our life is done on this planet. It's a life that continues forever. And that's what our soul was made for. I wanna invite you to stand and we're gonna pray. See, this isn't about following a list of rules. You remember thinking, oh, wow, what are my nose supposed to be? It's not the point. See, this is what's so awesome about following Jesus because when you follow Jesus, he leads you into the absolute best that your life was created for. He starts to show you, yeah, this is the no that you need to say. Your friend, it might not be a no for them, but it's a no for you right now. He helps Jesus when we follow Jesus. He shows us what knows are important for certain seasons of our life. He wants to lead you into his best. He wants to lead you into the all sorts of good things. Can we pray? I want, to I want you to close your eyes. And this prayer that we're praying is how we say yes to following Jesus. Can we pray out loud together? Just say, Jesus, thank you for everything you've accomplished at the cross thank you for starting a brand new story and i say yes to my life being a part of and living out this story jesus thank you for a brand new start as i follow you today amen amen come on can we give god thanks today god thank you god we are so excited we rejoice we rejoice with those. We, the reason why we pray out loud together is because nobody prays alone. And some of the, you in the, this room or maybe even watching online, that prayer was a first for you. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.